What is, does it mean for the global community when we are faced with notions of existential threat? We may be in the forefront as Pacific Islanders around understanding the impacts of climate change, but as a whole, what's our understanding when we are faced with this, this notion of existential threat to life itself on this planet? The climate emergency, and again, I'm going to come back and I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly here around Pacific futures. And I don't, I don't want to lament, but I think Jamie's point about how do you unknot or how do you unweave or how do we disentangle many of these critical issues. And I think I want to be very clear on the climate emergency stuff. It's, it's, it's that Pacific people's narratives have always been presented from what I view as a victimhood positioning, and that's problematic. If you look, again, because it comes back to these questions of scale and questions of agency. If you're landlocked, you come from a landlocked country and you first go to an atoll, it's a phenomenal feeling because you almost feel like you're just floating on water. And actually, when you visually fly into these atolls, they just look like strings in the ocean. And yet, in these spaces that people live in, particularly Kiribati, Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands that have these coral atolls, they understand climate emergency and existential threat every day of their lives. The king tides, the rising sea levels, they understand it. Coral bleaching, livelihoods, they get it. And I think one of my biggest really responses to Pacific Islanders, and I want to come back to this ocean as a metaphor, and probably our most powerful metaphor, because it allows Pacific Islanders to really, the framing of small, vulnerable, aid-dependent nations are highly problematic in, in, in terms of positions around agency, because it always will frame us as victims. We never created the climate crisis, yet we are at the forefront of it. And so Epeli Haofa and those who came before us gifted us this ocean metaphor to allow us to break the constraints and the framing around scale, because we would simply lose. You're talking about 2,000, 10,000 people in terms of population, 50,000 people. Really, what does it matter to the global community? That there is an ocean, oceanic worldview that demands to be heard and demands to be seen. It's a worldview that has constantly entertained and have allowed and created space for others to enter. It's not one that, that we can disentangle from because of the way we've been colonized, I don't think we can do away with that. But it demands to be seen and heard. And it is a worldview that is quite intelligent. Where do we go from here with such entangled narratives, both again, political, economic, military, social, cultural, and environment frameworks? Obviously, science has a role to play, a significant role to play. And I think we wouldn't disregard the role of science. Um, and the decade of science is coming up. And I think that's extremely important decade. We need to understand more 
about this ocean space. But I think in the crisis, particularly the climate emergency crisis, we need to grasp what it means to be faced with existential crisis. And so for me, I think I want to really challenge us. It would require more than just science or technological innovation. My point of view, we need new sets of senses. And I want to come back to the challenge that if the ocean is the heartbeat of our planet, we now need eyes that can hear the heartbeat of the ocean that speaks to us in ways that we probably didn't understand. We need ears that can fathom the depths of the ocean and what it offers all of us. And I want to end with an amazing story from a, an amazing navigator. So we were in the Marshalls last year and we met with him and we said to him, okay, you know, explain to us, how do you navigate? Yes, we can say you read the stars and you read the waves. And he, he told us a really amazing story, which I think I will end with. But he said, when we are in training, the elders would just throw us into the water and they would say, feel the land. And they would jump in the water and they kept jumping in the water. And he said that it's a sense that you develop, which is quite complex. And I think this is really where we need to head to in terms of emotional intelligence is that he said, so he said they used to lie because the elders would be saying, do you feel land? And they would say, yeah, we kind of feel land. But he said, you really become attuned to feeling land, depending on where they throw you in the ocean. If it was from the seaside, or if you're from inner reef side, the, the, the currents will speak to you about where land is. And it matters to have those senses, because when you're out in the real darkest of nights, you can miss those islands.